Welcome to The Rally. This podcast includes commentary and conversations about issues relevant to clinical psychology. It is intended to educate, entertain, and enlighten, and is not a substitute for actual mental health treatment. Individuals who share personally here choose willingly to tell their stories to benefit you, the listener. All other references to clinical situations are altered or limited to protect confidentiality. For more specific questions or help with a personal situation, please consult a local mental health professional. Therapy, mental health, real life. This is Psych Rally with Los Angeles-based clinical psychologist, Dr. Martin Shaw. Hello and welcome to Psych Rally. This is episode 20, which is brought to you by Conscious Life Shop, offering tools and products to facilitate self-reflection, self-care, and meditation. Find inspiration, insight, and honor your own conscious journey by checking out ConsciousLifeShop.com or check out the show notes here for episode 20 at PsychRallyPodcast.com. I'm totally stoked to be talking here today with uh, someone who has had a, a profound influence on my work as a therapist and greatly inspired me to spread my wings to uh, different endeavors, including starting this podcast. He himself is a board-certified clinical psychologist and one of my uh, former direct clinical supervisors during my graduate training. He's also an author, blogger, podcaster himself, visionary. Uh, Don't let him near any phone booths because no telling what amazing thing he might do when he flies out of it with a cape. He's Dr. Ryan House. (laughs) 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 You're just going to laugh. I have to laugh. All right, gosh. Flying out of it with a cape. Well. Fortunately, there aren't hardly any phone booths left. I was so. going to say, as I said that, you know, anyone under 25 probably is like, what, what's a phone booth? There are no phone booths. That's right. Anyways. Well, welcome, Ryan. Martin, it is my pleasure to be here. <laughs> if I would have thought back to whenever that was, a decade ago or so, <laughs> when you and I were in supervision, and I was trying to try to, uh, try to force you to become more psychoanalytically informed... And you were like, no, man, I'm all CBT. That is not at all what <laughs> happened. My gosh. We I thought here we'd be a decade later. Oh, my gosh. Okay, oh, there's a lot of page. things. We, they, so today is all about correcting negative assumptions and bad impressions. So oh, we'll just geez. start with that one right there. I, I didn't realize this was an intervention. This was like <laughs> a... Uh, it's an intervention for you. That's right. Nice. Uh, a couple of things about... Uh, <laughs> well, first of all, our, our theme today is um, psychotherapy's image problem. And... Uh, That's something Ryan and I take seriously as um, therapists, as psychologists. Um, So therapy is going to take one on the nose today, and let's see how we respond as representatives of of the field, yeah? Yeah. Uh, But before we do that, i got to say a couple of things about why why Ryan's a special person to make him feel thoroughly uncomfortable. Uh, Yeah. Uh, You know, first of all, as a direct clinical supervisor, it's just like when you're you're a, a resident and someone really shapes how you practice medicine. Ryan's definitely someone who has uh, shaped how I think mm. clinically and how I practice professionally. And it, more specifically, uh, I think he, he, you joked about it earlier, but uh, you're one of the people that sort of made psychoanalysis cool for me. <laughs> and, uh, and the reason I say that is, you know, and for someone who, who may be unfamiliar, psychoanalysis is sort of one uh, grouping of schools of thought and approaches to psychotherapy within the, the larger umbrella of psychotherapy. And... Uh, Within the range of psychoanalytic schools and approaches, there's some pretty deep and dark and heavy and intense ideas and, and theories. And perhaps correlating with that, there are some people who practice heavily uh, fr- from a psychoanalytic angle and tradition that are uh, equally uh, dark and heavy and intense <laughs> at times. <laughs> You're it, saying the people themselves are dark and heavy and intense? Well, I mean, they, they come across that <laughs> way as colleagues, I you see. know, and, yeah. uh, you know, and. This that stereotype is, oh, you, people find out you're a therapist, like, oh, are you psychoanalyzing me all, right now? And right. I'm like, well, no, I'm just trying to have a conversation. But uh, <laughs> sure. some people probably perpetuate that idea that make you feel very uncomfortable. Ryan is not that guy. He's very uh, well uh, steeped and knowledgeable about psychoanalytic tradition, and I benefit a lot from that and have benefited a lot from that since my early days in training. But he's also pretty cool, down-to-earth guy, self-effacing and uh, so I appreciate that. I, I, I thank you very much, yeah. Martin. I would say that I'm, 
I'm certainly not an analyst. I, you know, I didn't go to uh, psychoanalytic training, the four-year program, no, and all of that. Back, uh, backing um, down there. Just, just someone who kind of dabbles into the the depth of uh, of human existence. <laughs> um, probably more relational than uh, than analytic at this point, and right. that's and that's cool. All right. That's just uh, kind of formed by a couple decades of work that uh, kind of made me see that I, I don't know that I need to be plumbing uh, people's unconscious necessarily. Uh, sure. Let's just see what happens in the room. Yeah. Secondly. Uh, I credit Ryan as sort of a major inspiration and encourager for uh, this podcast, Psych Rally, um, just at, at some level because uh, about a year and a half ago, you yourself and um, a mutual fellow professional of ours, Dr. Steve Simpson, ran another podcast called The Mental Health Happy Hour, uh, which is no longer in production, unfortunately, but uh, you invited me on as a guest and we talked about uh, sort of the juxt- juxtaposing cognitive behavior therapy and the psychoanalytic tradition, and that was a lot of fun. So That was a lot of fun. Yeah, and so in the aftermath of that, I thought, oh, I'd be interested to take a stab at that myself and uh, ran that by you, and I think it's probably just less than a year ago. Right. You and I were sitting down over bento boxes for lunch, and you said, hey, man, got, go do it. Make, make, make it your own. So uh, thank you for that inspiration and encouragement. Yeah. Were we having bento boxes? It's something like that. Yeah, I think you're probably right. Yeah, right, right across the street here from your office. Yeah. Um, third, and this is something to launch off more of here, is um, uh, Ryan certainly is inspiring also in that he does not limit his gifts and talents and passions uh, about the practice of psychotherapy to his office. He is involved with blogging and has written books and uh, has launched all sorts of other projects, uh, including National Psychotherapy Day. Woo-hoo. Talk about National Psychotherapy Day, Ryan. What was the inspiration and what, what do you hope to uh, accomplish with that? I'll tell you, it uh, it was a few years ago. I mean, I, I've always kind of had this, this itching sort of problem that like psychotherapy doesn't really, um, doesn't have much of a, of a, of a PR program. Um, I mean, we have, we have our, our, our national organizations and our local organizations, the APA and, and here in Pasadena, the San Gabriel Valley Psych Association, and those are great organizations, but um, there's not a whole lot done to kind of just educate the public or to promote psychotherapy to the general public. And sure, and, and APA and local and California Psych Association are about psychology, yeah. broadly speaking, not exactly. just psychotherapy. Exactly. we do lots of different things as psychologists, right. and other people practice therapy who aren't psychologists. Exactly. Yeah. So I... You know, I was you know watching TV, seeing some ads for for medications. You know, the happy little bouncy face that uh, that uh, comes on for mm-hmm. um, for medications, and, and that's fine. I was thinking, God, why don't we have any sort of a of a program for for psychotherapy? You know, what we do instead as psychotherapists, we have our own. You know, if we're in private practice, you have your own website, you have your own your own presence out there, and we kind of compete with one another for for business. But who is out there saying? Psychotherapy is something that's important that uh, you know that the general public can can uh, grab a hold of. So I thought, let's just have one day, one day a year, when maybe all of us uh, mental health professionals, psychologists, social workers, MFTs, all everyone can just promote psychotherapy as its own day. Yeah. And then I you know I looked around and saw that you know like ice cream Sunday has a day and. <laughs> you know, pencil erasers have their own day. So why, maybe Everyone's psychotherapy. Got a day. Everyone's got a day. So yeah. let's just have a psychotherapy day. So I got together with a couple of uh, graduate students, and we, you know, just got a f- website and a Facebook page, and and sent out a bunch of notices and said, let's have one day where we promote the profession, where we um, try to reduce the stigma, where we try to share research and data that that shows the effectiveness of psychotherapy. And uh, let's get people to kind of talk about their own experiences of therapy. You know, what was it like for them? To be in therapy, what's it like to be a therapist? You know, let's just bring it out of the bring it out in the open because people just don't talk about therapy. Yeah, and it is such a tricky thing because on one hand, part of the reason for that is it's like so, like perhaps even more so than other types of work, right? The privacy, the security of it is so important. Absolutely, a cornerstone of uh, what makes it a safe place to uh, be open. Um, mm-hmm. So w- obviously, that's got to be handled sensitively totally I, yeah. I like to say that we are we're professional <laughs> secret keepers that's kind of our, <laughs> our job our title is that we are secret keepers that's what we do and that's mm-hmm. that's uh, that's and that's important and that's a required part of this work for, sure. order for people to feel safe enough to talk to us um, knowing that we're not going to be blabbing about uh, everything that's said but that also means that there's this sort of shroud of secrecy around the work and people don't know what happens behind 
behind our doors. And so that that leaves room for the media or you know popular movies or, 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 or fiction to uh, to depict kind of this distorted image of what actual therapy is about. And uh, I thought, you know, we need to do something to change that. Sure. I like it. What can uh, other therapists out there do to kind of help and get involved with uh, National Psychotherapy Day to promote the movement? Or Well, you know, they can wear turquoise. That's what they can do. That's <laughs> one, thing, one thing we did is... Uh, we also have a collaboration with the uh, tur- Color Turquoise brand. Yeah. You know? No, we... Not really. Not really. No, it was okay. just a, something suggested. The, the logo for, for National Psychotherapy Day happens to be turquoise. And so someone said, let's all wear turquoise on that day. So so I have one turquoise shirt. <laughs> for, for, <laughs> for the one day. For the one day that <laughs> I do wear that, yeah. Um, we could do more than that. We can, like I say, uh, sharing effectiveness research. I mean, there's there was a push a couple years ago in this. We, what we wanted to do was actually share with MDs, like, here is the effectiveness research for psychotherapy, hoping that maybe when people come to, to MDs that they would be more likely to say, hey, have you tried out therapy um, before just writing the prescription? Mm-hmm. Specifically, uh, you talk about psychiatrists. Or psychiatrists or, yeah. or, or general practitioners. Doctors, you know, someone yeah. comes in and says, I have, you know, I'm feeling down lately or I'm really anxious. Typically, they reach for the prescription pad. Maybe we could get them to, to do a little more referring to... Uh, to therapists. More and more research about integrating uh, men- mental and behavioral health mental care behavior. with primary care because what, what's the some crazy statistics about how many, what percentage of visits to a primary care physician involve some sort of emotional or psychiatric issue, depression, anxiety, what have you. I'm, yeah? I, I, I've seen those statistics and I was shocked and amazed, but yeah. I don't remember what they are. Yeah. Well, Pretty high. Yeah. Um, room for collaboration, put it that way. Room for collaboration, sure. Yeah. Um, I would say also, you know, just what, what regular professionals can do uh, would be if, if you can give a talk to the public, if you can, uh, you know, do, you know, donate some of your time to, uh, to, to promoting the profession, that would be great. Um, donate some time to maybe a, uh, a community mental health clinic just to support uh, staff there or to be, uh, you know, an hour of supervision here or there. Just, just something to give back to the, uh, to the mental health community would be fantastic. And just in your own life, you know, it's, it, I've, known, I've known a lot of therapists who would say that they don't, they don't want to talk about their own, the fact that they've been in therapy mm-hmm. or that they, uh, you know, kind of deny that they've been or maybe they haven't been in their own therapy, which kind of scares me. But mm-hmm. uh, you know, I think we need to, you know, the, the openness needs to start with us. Yeah. Let's talk about our own work and, uh, and reduce the stigma that way. I see. Now, a cynic out there, um, and we're going to talk about some, some cynics that you've heard from a little bit later. A cynic might say, well, this is just a chance for, you know, us therapists behind our closed doors to kind of pat ourselves on the back and make ourselves feel good about what we do. And ah. yeah. Okay. Now, what would you say? I, I, yeah, I, actually, funny you say that. <laughs> a few years ago, when I was first getting this off the ground, I, I spoke to a, a business guy who who uh, was like a, a consultant for business. I was saying, "All right, we want to put we're gonna promote this day," and he was like, "Wait, isn't isn't therapy a, a luxury for the for the upper class?" Mm-hmm. He said, "You know why? You know why would we why would we have a day that celebrates something that's just for you know for the elite, the small sector, yeah." And um, and he said, "You know, should we have a, a corporate lawyer day too?" <laughs> I was like. <laughs> No, <laughs> that's not, no, that wasn't it. No, I mean, the, the, I don't really mean he was an asshole. I mean that he, it was, it's a common distortion. Sure. The fact is that if – here's one set of statistics I do know. Mm. Um, one in four people experiences a mental illness at some point in their life. However to, defined, some sort of mental health concern. Yes, yes, sure. Yes, sure. And – and according to the latest statistics that I, I just saw in the APA monitor, 7% of, uh, of adults in the United States uh, had some form of outpatient psychotherapy treatment hmm. in the last year. Yeah. 7%. So that means that there's a discrepancy there of 18% at mm-hmm. least, right? People are not getting, I mean, and not to say they're not getting some treatment. A lot of those folks are going to medication right. instead. But, you know, there, there's certainly a, a, a big gap there. And also, you know, the, the whole idea that it's it's just a, uh, you know, a, a playground for the rich and famous is is ludicrous. Mm-hmm. I mean, a majority of, or a, a large percentage of the work is done in community mental health centers, in low-fee clinics. <clears throat> you know, the psychotherapy is, is is 
for for everybody. It's Ideally, not just yeah. um, you know, it's not just the uh, the Woody Allen um, you know neurotic on the couch. Sure. Now, certainly, it's one thing to say that there are a lot of challenges that make it hard for people to access uh, good psychotherapy in in some settings, and that might be a product of geography and uh, other things sure. too. But um, as you said, it's as far as you're concerned, as far as I'm concerned, it's it's we would love everyone to benefit from it if possible. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. And there's there certainly are some some more systemic issues there that yeah. that would say it'd be great if we could have uh, more high highly qualified therapists in, uh, in in more areas of the country yeah. i mean here in pasadena you you can't <laughs> can't turn around without seeing another therapist that's i mean there's right. there's we have a lot here and that's fine it's a it's a very therapy friendly sort of uh community but uh not everyone's like that not everyone's like that yes that's right um out of national psychotherapy day w- you've also launched another project i'll call it a project um and anyone who's listened to this podcast before has actually heard about it Multiple, multiple times. Yes. Um, but that's called Moments of Meaning. Yes. yes. Awesome. Talk about it. Okay. Momentsofmeaning.org. Yep. Yep. Momentsofmeaning.org. Moments of Meaning. So a big, again, uh, talking about uh, reducing the stigma mm-hmm. and letting people know what happens behind the closed doors of therapy. I've also been a listener to to different podcasts as well as uh, um, like TED Talks and the Moth Radio Hour and that right. sort of thing. And, and just the whole idea of storytelling has always been... Uh, has always appealed to me as a way of 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 sharing information that's that's in a in this really compelling format. So, sure. so I thought, well, what would it be like if we uh, got together a group of therapists and told some great stories, you know, well rehearsed and you know honed and crafted, uh, told some stories to to uh, you know a group of people, you know, coffee house style, that sort of thing. Um, but then recorded them and, and uh, let them go all over the earth. And hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> and so, yeah. To the so ends we, of Antarctica. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so we did that a couple of years ago. I guess we the, the recording of it was in, uh, in February of uh, 15, and then we did it again just a couple of months ago. That's right. And, uh, and I, think, I think maybe you know about that, I don't you? I know about it a little bit, yes. I think you know this experience. <laughs> well... Are you asking me to talk about it too? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Please. Well, I mean, yes. you. By the way, Martin. Martin had such good talks. Stop. Stop. He he, stop. he kicked off the the night both times. He was the the lead off. Uh, it's way, my more my way of managing my anxiety. <laughs> I, I don't think I'll do a good job if I'm later on in the lineup. <laughs> uh, watch the videos. You'll see. This guy's is cool as a cucumber. Well, right let's uh, let's talk about because uh, uh, round two, which we taped in October. Yep. Uh, is in sort of post production and going to be yes. wow, wow, coming out in in uh, in waves pretty soon, yeah. A whole a whole team of editors are working right. on it as we speak. A <laughs> team of one, <laughs> a team of one <laughs> editor working on it as we speak, and uh, and our our huge uh, promotional campaign will start here pretty soon. All right, okay. So we had uh, six talks last time. Yep. Uh, recorded at least, and uh, six more coming out. Sometime in the next, yeah, ideally month or two. Yeah, in the next in the next month. Okay, so look out for that. I mean, just just the the types of talks though. I mean, it's just we're talking yeah. about um, therapists. Most of the time, it's it's a therapist talking about a kind of an extraordinary experience they had in their own therapy. Um, and again, we're professional secret keepers, so we're not. You know, yeah. this is all distorted, or it's either the stories are, are distorted, or they're they're like amalgams of, of several different uh, experiences they had, or they have the full consent of the client. So there's no right. no uh, confidentiality breach here, but they're just sharing kind of what happens in these these little moments. And I say extraordinary, but honestly, if if you've been a therapist for a while, you know that a lot of these things happen kind of all the time. Mm-hmm. But they're just uh, the, the, these times. Like for example, your moment, your first moment. You know, was was uh, that was a heavy one. A heavy one, yeah. Talking yeah. with a client and having you know this kind of realization he comes to of of wow, maybe I don't have to feel so guilty. That's right. Yes. And uh, and we have those experiences all the time, and people don't know that. Mm-hmm. Yes, that's what we hope people realize. That's what we hope. Yeah. Any surprises, feedback, uh, just about the process of moments of meaning, how it's gone, and you know, I've heard I've heard from people all over the place. In yeah. fact. 
I don't know if, if, I, if I even told you this. Uh, um, do tell. But they are someone someone in Australia. Uh, you yeah, mentioned that. Heard yeah. about, watched the videos from from round one, and said, you know, we should do this over here. Very cool. We should throw some shrimps on the barbie and uh, <laughs> have some <laughs> therapy down under. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> And so, actually, in, in uh, so that's in the works. That's in the works. Oh in April of, of 2017, they're going to do a, uh, a moments of meaning. Awesome. Uh, outside of Sydney, Katumba. Moments of meaning. dot org slash au. I believe that's it. au or something like that. Yeah. So there's going to be more. I'd love to see it expand and, and just keep growing. All right. Spread the possible. gospel. Sure. Cool. Uh, I, I also think that, I mean, if you talk about any surprises, just the, the people who who have stepped into the storytelling, you know. It's it's, you know, we're therapists. We're not usually performers or or yeah. you know, uh, uh, really. You know, it's a, it's kind of an introverted profession for the most part, right? Um, well, we clearly, some people straddle both worlds. Yeah, some people do being straddle. Being here in LA, perhaps. Right. Maybe yeah. that's maybe that's true. Maybe yeah. we kind of have a, a bias there, but mm-hmm. um, but f- brave souls who get up there and say, okay, I really want to tell this story. I want to I want to work on this for months and get up in front of a hundred people. And put it out there on the internet. I mean, I, I'm just honored and, and shocked that people are, are willing to go and do the, all that work just to spread the word about uh, yeah. about what happens in therapy. Well, I got to tell you, when you pitched the idea originally a couple of years ago, I said that that's awesome. I got to be, I want to be part of that because <laughs> uh, I mean, I did some, we did some skit writing. And I don't know if I ever told you this, but this is sort of my background with being in front of a stage. Yeah. In college, a good friend of mine and I. Um, <coughs> had sort of a comedy troupe. Yeah. There's a bunch of Asian guys doing Asian accents and, and making dumb skits based on, off James Bond and Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. And it was a blast. It was fun. Um, and that sounds like fun. It was fun from start to finish. But, you know, it was pure entertainment. It was college. We were goofing off. So, so this, you know, as a professional uh, sort of contribution and uh, just knowing, as you said, what we're able to see and be part of in the room uh, every day is... is uh, you know, a higher calling in a sense. So, That's Martin, awesome. are the are yeah. the videos of these things going to uh, emerge someday? Uh, no, they're uh, they're they h- they're hidden in my email server somewhere, they're hidden? Which, which are very secure, <laughs> unlike other email servers. So. Okay, <laughs> I thought maybe they they were on the on the dark web. Or no, the, they're uh, probably on VHS somewhere, man. Collecting dust. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, so don't get great. your hopes up. Oh, when you're when it's time for your like your big roast at some point. <laughs> These things are going to get dusted <laughs> off. And Therapist roast? Them up and yes. This whole podcast is one long roast, so <laughs> just, you know, <laughs> take your shots. Um, Ryan writes, a, you write a blog called In Therapy, yeah, for psychologytoday.com, Psychology yes. Today magazine. Does yeah, it go yeah. in the magazine, too? Or just it doesn't go in the magazine. Okay. It's, just, it's their blog. That's on their blog. Um, so check that out. We'll link to it on the show notes here as well. And uh, y- you've written about tons and tons of things. I didn't actually, hadn't read most of them until oh, yeah? recently, but I was like, Oh, you've done a lot of good stuff on there talking about, you know, things that can go wrong in therapy, why people should go to therapy, little ins and outs, laughing in therapy, Kleenex in therapy, the oh different yeah. uh, different aspects, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, different types of religion and how they might interact with psychotherapy. And it's also putting you in contact with interviewing some big names in psychotherapy. Yes. And, and what you've told me, uh, that's... Uh, been surprising and interesting at times yeah absolutely i'll tell you yeah that's that's been one of the more <laughs> more fun I, I the blog was st- i started doing that in, in 2008 and uh and there were only a few bloggers on the site at that point and i was i was i just wanted again to kind of demystify therapy and and tell people kind of what goes on i thought well maybe people would be would find it interesting if i interviewed some of the big names in the field mm-hmm. so i sent out this email to like everybody everybody who uh, whose book was on my bookshelf basically you know who who are all these these big wigs out there did freud uh get back to you freud freud didn't get back to me no probably a reason for that yeah Yeah. (laughs) young those guys not so much young not so (laughs) much (laughs) no um thomas saws got back to me actually before before he passed away a few years ago oh so it didn't didn't quite pan out didn't quite no he no he oh you got him i I didn't read that one okay cool um but yeah, I was I was amazed at, at that point. Like, wow, so these people are willing to <laughs> to write back to me, and yeah. I'm, I'm a nobody. They're willing to write back and answer some questions and uh, and help me kind of spread the word of, about psychotherapy. And it was uh, good experiences. Mm-hmm. And in fact, yeah, had some great experiences e- emailing people, talking on the phone to some people, and actually got to to sit down with with one of my big heroes, um, 
at one point as well, which was uh, Irvin Yalom. He flew down in person and sat here and had he, hot cocoa with you? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I associate him with hot cocoa for some reason. <laughs> sort of humanistic kind of guy, he's, warm, he's, he's, comforting. He's, grandfatherly sort yeah, of guy you right. can sort of, sort of see him with uh with the hot cocoa <laughs> um no i was actually up in the bay area oh, it just gotcha. so happens and i dropped by his place oh cool i see and we uh and he beat me at, at chess and really not really okay all right but we had a good time together had a nice little talk any uh sort of surprising or uh n- not as fun experiences through interviewing these big names well, I mean, <laughs> of course, I was, I've been turned down a whole lot as much as I've been. <laughs> yeah. Um, so a lot of folks just, just wouldn't do it. Um, but I had some interesting surprises. Um, uh, Donald Meichenbaum just insisted that I, I do a lot of swearing for him on, on the... Uh, really? <laughs> he wanted to talk about how a lot of, uh, a lot of therapeutic uh, modalities are just bullshit. <laughs> so he wanted you to swear? He, he, no, he wanted oh, to make he sure wa- that I... That I, I put that in there oh like, okay i tell people that there's bullshit that, that out there okay all right i'll, 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 I'll do that okay. um Keep the rated pg-13 there bud yes yes yeah sorry about the explicit label yes. there well, um i don't mean you i mean mike and bomb <laughs> right <laughs> well i mean he's he's just a the guy knows what he knows oh, what he okay. wants okay. um uh john gray i got to speak with john gray of of, of men are from mars women are from Venus fame mm-hmm. you remember, yes. remember that oh book? yeah yeah it was a bestseller for a long time. I think I saw it for sale at the uh, Goodwill store for about two dollars. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. It's a bit dated now. It's it's quite a bit dated. <laughs> um, you know, you may you may love it, you may hate it. It's it's now kind of one of those books that's sort of like part of the the national mm. just vocabulary, though. You know, yes. Whenever people talk about differences between men and women, it's always old oh, men are from Mars, women are from Venus, right? <laughs> um, interesting. As I was talking with him. And uh, and one of the questions that I had for, for everybody was like, you know, what do you what do you love about being a therapist? And uh, and he wrote wrote back and he said, you know, actually I spoke to him on the phone, so it was phone call. And he said, you know what, what's what's one of the best parts of being a therapist is when I hear all of the problems that other people go through, and then I compare that to my own life and I think, wow, I really don't have it all that bad. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, oh uh. gosh, maybe. Maybe that's true sometimes, yeah. but I don't. I, I I don't think that's something we talk about. That'd be another way to phrase that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. That's Aside not from why you do the work. No. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I have interesting little surprises here and there. Never actually read the book, by the way. Is there a reason why he picked Mars and Venus? I couldn't I, have been men or from why not Saturn or uh, Mercury or anyways. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe because they are sounded better. Because those are those planets are oh, our Venus, neighbors. Oh, yes. uh, Venus. Venus. Or it's, uh, yeah. I'm your Venus. I'm your fire. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> I'm not sure. It's I don't know. Either I blocked out that book or I have never read it. I'm not sure. <laughs> Probably the latter. Yeah. Um, okay. So on your blog, uh, let's let's talk about some of the feedback you've gotten because. Uh, oh man. I'm real, yeah. I mean, I'm realizing this, this is my roast. Come well, on. No, well, I mean, hey, it, it's out there. Anyone can read it, right? Um, it's true. And hey, me doing this podcast, like I can, I'm gonna get under fire at some point if I haven't already. I don't realize it. Um, after this one, I know. No, it'll probably be still you after this one. But <laughs> um, uh, so one post that you wrote was called um, Eight More Reasons to Go to Therapy," and that was, yeah, uh, as I read it, sort of a follow up to an article that Huffington Post wrote about their eight reasons or something to go to therapy. And uh, you know, you cited things such as you know improving. Improving self-acceptance and self-esteem, well, forgiveness. Let me just throw that here. Oh, please. The Huffington Post piece was eight reasons to go to therapy. And it was like, here, and this is what one of the things that bugs me. Mm. People saying, here are eight, th- eight reasons why you should go to therapy, mm. right? You should go if you, um, you know, if you have depressive sy- symptoms or you're irritable at work or all these kind of negative things, right? Saying like, it's almost, when people use that language, it's almost like, like it's a punishment. Mm. Like, oh, you need to go to therapy. So I thought, all right, there. These are legitimate reasons why people go, you know, to, to, uh, to resolve, you know, uh, deeper kind of emotional issues and conflicts and that sort of thing. But there are other reasons people go to therapy too. Sure. People go not necessarily for disorders. 
people go sometimes to work on communication to Indeed. to try to uh, figure out the meaning of life to uh, <laughs> or the meaning of their life right. right what's my purpose what's my goal to uh, to sort through kind of occupational issues so it's not Absolutely. always something that's a that's a, a DSM diagnosis that brings people into therapy general I, self exploration yeah absolutely yeah. so i wanted people to know <clears throat> look there are, there are more reasons than just these pathology reasons to go to therapy indeed yeah and then i think you you touched on a lot of that in the article sure somebody disagreed <laughs> <laughs> there's always somebody who disagrees um uh, i'll read what this person wrote and again this is uh it's a public forum it's on a blog you can read it too and uh, so we're not giving any uh, sensitive client material away here this is what someone wrote uh he or she said therapy is not a form of treatment it's closer to moralistic religion or paid friendship or life coaching. It is dangerous, unproven, lacking in evidence, and wildly speculative. Uh, it should be a last resort only. Going for casual reasons, as described, represents a horrible risk-benefit scenario, plus the idea that some stranger can teach you to forgive or love yourself is preposterous. Whew. <laughs> Whew. All Ouch. right. What, 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 what say you? Oh, man. Mm. Well, there's so much Let's there. swallow that one there. Okay, so this is—I mean, this is the reason why I write the blog. Mm-hmm. This is the reason why I, I do all these you know, nice psychotherapy day things, is because I, this, that is just so wildly out of touch with, with at least what I know, mm-hmm. uh, at least what the, the research says, at least what uh, what the testimonies of millions of people would say. Yep. Um, but somehow this this viewpoint is is still out there in existence. Um, saying that it's it's nothing more than than a, uh, a paid friendship. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've heard that before. Rent a friend, that sort of thing. Um, boy, there are a lot of differences between psychotherapy and friendship. At least, at least as far as I know. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Maybe maybe that's not the case for you. Really. Uh, I mean, I have some good friends, but there's things. <laughs> yeah, right. There's things that you that are uncomfortable to share with someone in your personal life, even if they're close, right? Absolutely. You know, the the therapist is. It's a contained place. You call it a laboratory. Yeah. I like that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I consider it as kind of a, a laboratory, a, a, a microcosm of, uh, of life, really. It's a place where we go in and we um, put, their, put their life under the microscope mm-hmm. for a little while and, uh, and, and try out things, experiment with things. So, yeah, so it's certainly, I, I mean, as far as just the friendship piece goes, yes, there's, this is a... Uh, it's it's objective, you know. I'm I'm someone who is outside of that person's mainstream life. I've I've spent a lot of time in my own therapy and my own training to to try to figure out what's my stuff versus what's their stuff, mm-hmm. right? So I so I'm not going to be distorting that. Yeah, oftentimes with a friend, they're giving you advice, but they're really kind of talking to themselves. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes, no. I, I had a good friend once who um, was you know just really having a hard time with his sister, who was just being a pain in the butt and. Yeah. Uh, was telling another friend about it, and then the friend said, "Oh my gosh! Like, what is wrong with your sister? Like, she's just being mm-hmm. such a man." And then, then my friend says, "Well, oh, hold on! Like, it, this is still my sister we're talking about, <laughs> right? Like, don't, don't, don't get throw her under the bus. Like, it's one thing to yeah. be understanding and supportive of me, but you don't have to go attacking her either. That's not what I'm looking for. So, it, you know, it gets tricky. It, you know, it does and get tricky. People in personal life might have their own relationship with some of these people that are uh, challenging." And uh, that kind of colors how they respond, yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So, I've 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 even had clients who just say it r- outright. You know, I love having an hour a week where I can come and talk and kind of sort through my stuff, and I don't have to ask you anything about you. Mm-hmm. Like I don't have to care about like <laughs> like the assumption is it, you know if I'm here I'm working that day then I've, I'm I'm like good to go. Like yeah. I, I don't need. I'm not looking for my clients to affirm my. It's not for you. Yeah. It's not because it's not. This hour isn't for me. It's for the client. Sure. Like some people are like grateful. Oh, good. I don't have right. to turn the, the the conversation around at some point and say, "So, tell me about your weekend." That's right. You know? Although some people like to do that. So some people do. A separate issue. Right. And well, I think uh, implicit is the idea that somehow if you that if you pay for it or that it's okay, it's a laboratory. This is one office, one place. Um, that that it's not genuine, it's not real. So it doesn't apply to right. uh, the li- the world outside. I think that's maybe in some ways what I'm hearing in this comment. Um, but I think what I would say is, you know, that's you know, you running with the laboratory uh, analogy, right? I mean, for scientists who do research, they do it in a lab, they right. do it in a petri dish under 
uh, controlled conditions under a microscope and uh, that's just the way it needs to be done and sure yes it's controlled and in, in that sense it's uh, you're removing other variables but that doesn't mean it doesn't have value or implications to contribute to you know the body of scientific research outside the lab yeah absolutely yeah absolutely i mean that's that's the whole point I, and that's what you know i talk about being a little more you know more relational these days right um a lot of times what i you know if a, let's say a client has a hard time uh asserting themselves right or maybe maybe confronting somebody mm -hmm. And if I know that from the very beginning, you know, this is one of their, their issues, then we'll put that right out there and say, hey, you know, at some point you may want to confront me yeah. on something in your life, some sort of experience. Or, or maybe something I said. or Something, something I said, yeah. or maybe I was a couple minutes late, or maybe I, you know, put my foot in my mouth or forgot your cat's name or whatever it was. <laughs> and maybe you want to confront me and let's, let's do that. You yes. Know, that's, that's great practice for us. It's good, good work in the laboratory. And if they can do that, they're like, okay, you know, Here's something I was upset, upset. You said something last week and it upset me. And so here we go. Boom. Then we just, oh, that's great. <laughs> let's, yes. uh, let's enjoy that and let's uh, practice that. And let's see if we can now um, apply that in the outside and world. And that does carry over to the outside world. I believe it does. It's, it's funny that that comment talks about specifically um, like forgiveness, you mm -hmm. know, the idea that, that therapy can help you forgive. That's a huge part of our work. It's a huge part of what I, what I yep. work on with people, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, wounds from their past that they need to, to kind of work through and grieve and forgive and move on. That is a huge part of our work. Sure. Like that's, that's it just strikes me as like, that's one of the more, um, you know, we're not, we're not curing schizophrenia maybe in, uh, in psychotherapy, but to help people move past uh, life events, that's, that's kind of a big part of our work. Big part of what we do. Yeah. Well, and the 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 relationship is part of laboratory and the dynamics between us as therapists and our clients is important and but and i would say to kind of work in a cbt-ish sort of piece is you know even at a behavioral level uh i can think of people who dealt with insomnia which is kind of anxiety about sleep in a sense mm -hmm. and even just saying the word insomnia was difficult for a person Wow. Would raise a sense of anxiety and even having them say that in the room together it sounds so silly it sounds so basic but for this person was actually really helpful to do that with me there that we could talk about with uh you know and kind of process that and calm down and then eventually work towards saying that outside of the room uh you know so absolutely you know the wow. relationship in that case is part of it but um not central in the same way but i was still able to be there and having the laboratory to do that together was helpful for this. What do you person. think that's about? The the even saying the word insomnia was hard. I think it's because, from what I recall, well, there was an association of the experience of anxiety, of panic, of sort of physiological ah. arousal. Of this is what I experience. Again, I'm getting into. What are you taking me off tangent here? But uh, <laughs> for, <laughs> for someone who uh, had anxiety around sleeping because of the amount of pressure yeah. and okay. expectation i should be able to sleep a certain number of hours and what happens if i don't and i'm gonna not be at my on my a game tomorrow and sure. what if this lasts forever because i can't you know for months i haven't been able to fall asleep on my own and then there's just so much pressure anxiety frustration built up around getting in bed and lying down which ideally for most of us should be relaxing and facilitative of sleep but for some people with insomnia it becomes the opposite so we sort of have to yeah, uh, and even the word insomnia was associated with all those thoughts and feelings of tossing and turning at night. And yeah, it's interesting. I hear yeah. I hear so. that, and I think of of like shame, right? Mm. You know, someone who I, I I should be able to sleep, but I can't. So even s admitting to the fact, owning the fact that yeah. I have insomnia is the shameful sort of thing. Like I shouldn't have to deal with this, right? If you imagine something as basic as falling asleep, mm -hmm. right? Babies can do that sometimes with help. <laughs> yeah, nice. But it's like that's one of the first things that we learn. And for a, a grown person to feel like, I, f I can't do this anymore, right? I mean, yeah. that's very concerning. Cause a lot of anxiety. Um, good tangent. Good tangent. Let's, uh, another blog you wrote oh was boy. called Seven Mistakes Therapy Clients Make, How to Sabotage Your Therapy. Now, <laughs> okay. this was written with a highly uh, you know, clear disclaimer uh, that this is satire. Yeah. How about how about one mistake a blogger can make? Okay. We're <laughs> <laughs> just trying to write a just a satirical piece about sensitive issues with uh, the general public. Okay. That right. Was, uh, that was my. 
my my little if I could undo that. <laughs> Kevin and Bean have a bit called Wouldn't you like to take that back? <laughs> <laughs> That's I could I would like to take that oh, back. Okay. I say several times in the piece this is satire. I'm not really saying that you're you know, you're making all these mistakes or this is what you should do in therapy. But uh but boy Sensitive topic. It was a sensitive topic. Yeah. Okay. So a couple of things that you touched on in that article were, at least the main gist that I got was kind of what we're talking about is talk about things in therapy. Yeah. If you have a, a problem or, or a misgiving or, or a concern or something that happens in, with the therapist, don't avoid it. Talk about it. Be open about your questions. Uh, if, if there's something that threatens whether you want to continue with this therapist or not, bring it up with the therapist rather than... Um, just stop showing up because at least gives the opportunity to talk about and learn something from it. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's some of the things that you talked about in that article. Uh, totally. Yeah. I mean, th- yes. I, I always come back to the idea of you know this has been called psychotherapy has been called the talking cure, and and I think that's it. Words are our commodity. We have we have to. It's not it's not gestures. It's not actions. It's not kind of reading between the lines. It's let's actually put words to what it is that we are feeling what we're experiencing in in the therapy in our lives and so the more that we can put words to it like insomnia Mm -hmm. or whatever we might need to to say to a therapist um i think is is beneficial for people yeah for sure having said that (laughs) all right let's get to the uh the negative feedback here so someone else wrote in response to (laughs) man we're just gonna go back and forth here right um he said i truly think that clinically and financially tied Applied therapy and psychiatry is hit or miss, 50-50 nonsense. I mean, sure, I believe there are disorders, but I don't think many are getting treated right or at all correctly in most cases. If the person has helped, it's sheer luck and good timing and a great home support system doing it, which not everyone has. I don't think you can pay someone to really care about you or your psychological state. It doesn't work. It's full of many icky holes. Uh, the fundamental flaw in therapy is that all that fake, warm, friendly, inviting, quote, we care about you and you can say whatever, end quote, uh, feels put out to the clients are not real nor genuine at all, which this article amplifies this, nor is the concern nor care for the client in any real sense of what caring is. Wow. Man. Let's absorb that one, too. Jeez. <laughs> oh, yeah. That stings. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Well. Okay, <laughs> but, but it's a it's I mean it's an important point because yeah. again this is what uh, what a lot of people think about mm-hmm. about therapy. Now I could go into how you know uh, there have been many outcome studies and and research showing the uh, effectiveness of psychotherapy. Yeah, because there has been a lot of that. Indeed, I mean p- plenty of it. Um, Google it; you can find there's there's effectiveness <laughs> research. The APA did a, a big thing uh, four or five years ago where they looked at all of the effectiveness research, and uh, people say, well, the APA did it, so maybe they're biased. But honestly, it's just that's they found that the, generally speaking, people benefit from therapy across approaches and orientations too. Across approaches yes. and orientations, right? Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, it doesn't really <clears throat> depend on that. That having been said, um, there's some there's some truth to this. Not everyone gets better in therapy. Not yeah. not all therapy is beneficial and helpful for people. Uh, sometimes we we know this. Sometimes therapists can do more harm. Yeah. Um, I what I, what I don't you know I want to be a, a proponent for psychotherapy, but I can't be a uh, an apologist for all psychotherapists. Right, individually. Yeah. Well, and I think what I see from reading the comments to some of your blog entries and things that I've been exposed to recently through this podcast, right, is. I mean, I I like to think, you know, people like you and me practice ethically and are thoughtful about what we do and and thorough and seek consultation and are always, you know, humble and trying to advance more with what we know and uh, honing our craft, if you will. Um, But, uh, uh, you know, even in spite of that, there may be a lot of people out there who aren't as thoughtful about it or Mm -hmm. or I don't know or or just... um, or it's not a good fit, or there's yeah. a, you know there's miscommunications mm-hmm. and, and all sorts of things. Could many factors involved? Clearly, some people um, not only don't get the care they need and deserve, but are actually harmed further by mental health professionals, by therapists specifically, and that's yeah. really unfortunate. This this is a, a point that the that the right the uh, commenter made a couple times though is about about caring. You know, par- paying to care. You know. Yeah. Um, and I've, you know, I certainly hear this in my own practice, and I've and I've come across that question many times, writing, and um, and there's something I, I say to, to some clients when when they've raised that, you know, well, you know, 
uh, I pay you. You can't really, you don't really care about me because I pay you. So, you know, this isn't a real relationship mm. for that reason, right? And I like to say, look, you're, you're paying me for my time and you're paying me for my experience, my training. Indeed. Um, but you can't pay, you're right, you can't pay me to care. That's something that I, I give freely. Mm. And if it feels like I'm not, if it feels like I'm lacking in care f- for you, then let's talk about that. But, uh, you know, as far as I'm, my, as far as I'm concerned, I care about you. I care about what's going on in this yeah. for you and what's going on in our work together. And if that's not felt, then there must be some sort of a, a problem in the in the transmission of that, you know? Well, there's also an assumption that once uh, someone stops coming or stops paying us, that a therapist stops caring. And right. forget, uh, somehow just forgets about that person and, and all the experiences that you share with them. Um, but mm, we know that's not the case. We know that's not the yeah. case. Um, that might it might mean it might not mean that we need to keep providing a service for them because if they're doing well they're doing well or if therapy just wasn't serving them anymore so be it right. but that doesn't mean that the caring stops or the memory and the impression of that person is just sort of washed away or neutral you know? I, I gotta tell you here's here's an experience mm-hmm. uh, uh, d- distorted and disguised of course but, uh, I, I t- saw a client uh, when he was 16 years old this was many many years ago mm-hmm. right. 16 year old guy he was dealing with with different stuff in his life and uh you know just kind of parent child issues typical teenager stuff right so i had him for a few months back then just about a month ago i got a phone call hmm. from the same guy and he came back to therapy and it had been 16 years wow. since i'd seen him right so half a lifetime half a lifetime right <laughs> so so here I got the snapshot of him at 16 and now, you know, at 32. Wouldn't recognize the person. Wouldn't enough. recognize yeah. him. But but at the same time, it, it, it's yeah, funny. You do. Yeah. We, we, we kind of picked up where we left off in some ways, you yeah. know, some little inside jokes, some little things that we kind of remembered about each other and and uh, some little things that, that happened in the early therapy. It's like we were still connected. And that was that that's, was awesome. That neat. was a great experience. That's special. You know, a whole, yeah. whole different set of issues that he's dealing with now. But, you know, it was, it was fun. Fun to reconnect <laughs> like that. And a whole different set of issues that you're dealing with now from when 16 years ago. Exactly. You wouldn't know too much about that. So exactly. That's fine. You wrote also, uh, well, let me say this first, too, is people talk about how, you know, paid friendship, too, right? That, that, yeah. That that's, it's not genuine. It's, it's, it's not real. So, you know, you're, you're deluding people. Well, there, there are plenty of therapists out here doing what we do. So clearly there's a market for what we do, and some people are benefiting from it. So I would say, yes, that's not to minimize or validate, uh, invalidate, you know, some people's experience where they felt like this was just, you know, a paid hour um, and a transactional relationship, if you will. Sure. Because uh, there's some people out there who maybe that's that's what happened. And that's that stinks. Um, but, you know, we're here. We're practicing. Um, and, there's, yeah. and there's lots of us out here all over the place, all over the world. So that's that's got to say something. And I would say, well, as long as there is a market for what we do, um, I would at least uh, rather there be people who are thoughtful, thorough, well-trained, sensitive, and able to handle these things in a uh, you know compassionate and effective way. Uh, ra- uh, you know, to to balance out some folks who maybe not as much. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. That's, maybe that's another way to say it. Maybe well, well, we're here, so let's at least try to do it well. Right. Yeah. Well, and honestly, this is another piece where, where, mm-hmm. if people talked a little more about therapy, this might be something that mm-hmm. uh, that would 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 work its way out, right? Yeah. Like maybe if people were to say, okay, this is, you know, this is this is what I experienced in therapy, and this is what it was like for me, and then someone else who's who's in a, in a therapy that doesn't seem to be going anywhere, they might think, huh. Yep. That's not what my therapy's like. Maybe mm. I should do something about that, right? right? Well, figure out what's what the difference is. Yeah. Does my therapist know why this is different? Or? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You know, mm-hmm. everyone you know can compare notes about what it's like at their gym or at you know with their MD or at their dentist. You know, oh, my dentist really is like this. Well, sure. my dentist's like that. Oh, Blaze Pizza is really better than uh, Pizza Rest. Exactly. Right. <laughs> sure. Exactly. I like the crust here. Well, the toppings are better here. Right. Yes. <laughs> I think Rev's better I don't know. Place. We, better, we better move on. From okay. That. Yeah, it's all right. Pizza therapy. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> 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 Woo. All right. Water break. <laughs> you wrote a f- couple, uh, a series of articles about transference. So I think we should define what transference is, and transference is for the non-therapist, uh, but more specifically, erotic transference. And there's a there's a oh man yeah there's a comment you got that I think would be really interesting to talk about too. That's again along the theme of 
therapy's image problem. But talk about transference and erotic transference, what that really means, translated for the layperson. Wow. Okay. Um, transference would be when we it, it's it's sort of making this this uh, assumption that we kind of have a template in our mind of like a few different types of relationships, especially mm-hmm. really powerful relationships, right? So so when we grow up grow up and we have a mom and a dad and we have uh, you know siblings or whatever the configuration is there that we kind of relate to other people in ways that are similar to how we related to those formational those basic relationships right yeah so I might see a uh, an, an older an older male and I might just kind of just kind of jump into the role of being son to father mm. with this person right or it, it, it doesn't, it, it's not all that magical or mystical. It's really just a relational thing, right? Like maybe I had a friend who, who reminds me a lot of Martin when I was in high school. <laughs> and so when I see Martin, I just start kind of joking just like I did with my old, my old friend in high school. Or berating him with all sorts of F-bombs. And yeah, sure. Right, for example. No, not really. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> so it's just, it's just it, when, you, when you transfer your feelings in one relationship to another relationship, that's yeah. what transference really is. Well, and you said it's not necessarily mystical or magical, but I think w- the way it can be is th- in the sense that it can be subtle and mm-hmm. automatic and uh, yeah. not always a, uh, certainly a conscious process. Yeah. A common thing that happens is, especially in therapy, right, where uh, let's say I'm working with somebody who had, had maybe very, very critical, harsh, judgmental uh, caregivers when they were growing up, right? And they come in and they might assume, since I'm another caregiver, right, mm-hmm. I'm in the role of caregiver, they might assume that if they say something, I'm going to be harsh and judgmental right. towards them, yes. right? And so, so sometimes we have to, you know, the work of therapy is sort of separating that out and saying, you know what, I understand that, that you may be expecting me to be harsh and judgmental, but actually this is what I really feel. And that turning on that light can be very helpful for a lot of people. When they start to realize, oh wow, I've been seeing every authority figure in my life yeah. as as harsh and judgmental. When really, gosh, half of the people in my life have been really loving, and I didn't even realize that. Or are all um, men who are in a position of authority sure. are uh, you know going to betray me or hurt me? Right. Uh, or women, well, whatever it is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so th- this is where therapy can be helpful for uh, ideally for cor- correcting the cycle of abuse, right? Yeah. Like without realizing it. You know, I see all men a certain way or all people in authority or caregivers uh, a certain way, and maybe that keeps me on guard. Maybe that uh, prevents me from getting better or allowing someone to really help me. Um, but in the laboratory, right? Laboratory. Uh, hopefully we can uh, uh, realign some of that or tease some of it out, as you said. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. We can start to see that that this, is, this person isn't exactly the same person from the template mm-hmm. that you're drawing from. That's right. Yeah. Now, with erotic transference, because you talk about that in your yeah. article, m- my sort of very specific uh, foray into that would just be to say that, you know, one of the ways that you can transfer feelings or a previous template onto the therapy context or a therapy relationship would be uh, feelings that are uh, romantic, romantic or sexual. Sure. Yeah? Sure. So, uh, I want to say any more about that? And <laughs> <laughs> or you, do you want, I mean, what do I mean to... Uh, Elaborate on that a little. Uh, you, you're welcome to before we read this audience oh. feedback. Okay, just just one little piece to that, yep. which is, it's some people think it's a it's a it's a bad thing or it's something you know you really have to watch out for. I would say it's it's fairly common mm-hmm. because imagine you take someone who maybe has had uh, a deficit of loving, caring people in their life, right. then they come to therapy and the therapist is a trained like professional caregiver right this is what we do we listen and Mm we pay attention and we affirm and we're empathic and warm all that kind of stuff of course you're going to have positive feelings towards this person of course you're going to feel like this is this this feels great i I love how this feels and it doesn't it's not too much of a leap to think gosh i'd love to have more of this in my life Mm -hmm. i'd love to take this home with me Mm -hmm. i'd love for this to be um you know my 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 soulmate my partner so that can happen and it does happen and and it's it's not uh, something to run away from necessarily, if if possible, and if the therapist is able to talk about it, yep. it's great to be able to talk through that when you realize again, okay, this is not uh, this is maybe more a fantasy than it is. Um, you know, this isn't, isn't going to happen. Professional therapy never includes sex, all of that. Uh-huh. 
But uh, well, which assumes that the therapist is equipped and trained yes. and thoughtful enough to handle it sensitively. That's yeah. So that's where we we got so explain it to do. Yes. Right. So, so what's your comment? Okay. So not my comment, but someone wrote this on your <laughs> blog. Dear Doctor How How uh, How's. Uh, I feel like telling my therapist, uh, so, sh- you know, a little uh, background. Apparently, this person was seeing a therapist that she had developed some, okay. you know, more the extra therapeutic feelings for. Read your blog and sort of took you up on that. So she says, uh, I feel like telling my therapist that I was experiencing client therapist transference turned into a mess. I told him almost verbatim the way you indicated in your article would be the best way to talk to him about it. Instead of acting like this was something most therapists deal with, he completely withdrew from me in both a physical and psychological sense. He pushed his chair so far away from me that he accidentally bumped into the wall behind him. <laughs> Ouch. He crossed his legs and arms, and he even put his notebook in front of his body. Mm. I felt deeply hurt and scared that he was assuming such defensive postures. He didn't want to talk about the transference at all. I was very afraid he was going to want to, that he was going to want to end therapy with me because of his discomfort. Wow. So I decided to tell him that I figured out what caused the transference and that it had nothing to do with him. I did everything I could think of to get things back to where they were before I mentioned the transference. Boy. Uh, All right. Eesh. Yes. Okay. So. Yes. What is this? What do we do with that? I mean, if, you know, assuming that that's, that's really what, what happened yeah. when the person confronted the therapist or said, you know, this is something I'd like to talk about. Um. Yeah, that shows me a, maybe a therapist who's not so comfortable with that. Oh, uh, clearly. <laughs> that particular material, you yeah. know. Um, and did some harm as a result. And did some harm, yeah. yeah. Made the client feel yeah. bad and then and then made the client kind of undo what what she just said. Sure. Um, even though, you know, it wasn't a resolved issue. She just wanted to take it off the table. Yeah. So, you know, to be honest, okay, if they, they say – teach uh, supervision class, right? They say that, that actually supervision is about half of our training. We didn't have a whole lot of, there, there isn't a whole lot of, of, other than legal and ethical stuff, there isn't a whole lot of stuff about about actually dealing with um, counter-transference in, uh, in therapy sessions for, for, tra- for, for therapists. I mean, I don't know if you had much of that. Counter-transference, you should say, by the way, is... Is the therapist's right. feelings towards the client, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so in dealing with these issues of erotic transference, it usually comes up in, in supervision. Between uh, tr- therapists in training and their supervisors, exactly. potentially, yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And <clears throat> and some people don't talk about it in mm-hmm. supervision. You know, the supervision has to be a place where they feel, where the client, or the, the therapist feels safe enough to bring it up with their supervisor. I guess I'm just saying that, that overall, this is probably an area, uh, this is an area where, where I think as as we're training new therapists, we need to do a better job of equipping them to have these sorts of conversations. I think that is a, a, a deficit. Yeah, and, and I think uh, I, I was fortunate to have some training with that. Um, I could always use more, but I think we all could. And that's, as you said, it's a lifelong process, right? But, right. Uh, I never told you about my – I've told you all my feelings for you, Ryan, pretty much on this <laughs> podcast already, by the way. But um, – <laughs> none of which were inappropriate. They were very appropriate. Oh, no, very appropriate. But um, – yeah, you know, it's um, for programs that are heavily emphasizing other approaches to therapy, which in and of itself can be a good thing where people really feel they, they have one thing down. Uh, they might de-emphasize this aspect of really sort of the deeper, um, mm. s- more subconscious kinds of things like transference or counter-transference, if you will, um, that, you know, right, it's, it's, it's not as much invited, welcomed, let alone handled outrightly in supervision or emphasized from in the classroom so that you know therapists perhaps like this person that this uh, unfortunate uh, individual yeah. saw doesn't know what to do with it or is extremely uncomfortable with it or just you know hasn't dealt with something of of his own right you know that unfortunately you know when this client sort of reaches out for help he you know kind of without realizing it slaps her on the hand exactly well, not without realizing but maybe you know, maybe that wasn't his intention, but uh, that's what happened. Yeah, you know, I, yeah, he just didn't. It sounds like someone who wasn't wasn't really equipped to yeah. have that conversation in that moment. Got a little stunned by it and mm-hmm. uh, and retreated. And and yeah, so that's uh, you know, again, we we need to be um, aware that this is something that is quite common 
yeah and and really make it a part of the training doesn't reflect well on our profession when um, no. in other settings and in other offices this kinds of stuff happens so um, yep hopefully we're on the front lines of trying to correct that for some people I agree yeah okay termination or that's a, a fancy term that we use it's not that fancy but um, ending therapy <laughs> right There's plenty plenty of things out there that people talk it's about a highfalutin word yeah it's right psychobabble <laughs> yes um, you know which is you know some other people gave you flack for on the on the blog too I saw but yeah um, termination but you know it's like plenty of talk out there why someone should start therapy why you should go to therapy yeah right um, to deal with XYZ etc okay what happens if you feel like you've met that goal or what happens if it's not working out well uh, you're not getting your needs met from the therapist um, not so much talked about that. And so you did a whole series on yeah. the blog about termination, if you will, in therapy and some of the issues that can arise from that, uh, that some people will ghost uh, their <laughs> therapist, if you yes. will. Um, and just, you know, if it's not working out, just not show up. Yeah. Just stop coming without, without any word or email or voicemail or, or effort to work it out. And, and I think that was, again, one of your main points is to, well, at least let's try to talk it out. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, I mean, let's, let's talk it out, meaning let's have actual closure, you know? Yeah. And, and, and the point I try to make often is we don't have enough good endings in life, mm. you know? We don't have enough things that end well, right? You, you know, there are breakups or death or, or different things where people... Uh, where divorces. The, the, divorces, right. Yeah. Where oftentimes uh, it's either sudden or there's just this disappearance um, or there's like bad blood between them. You know, let's have, let's have a good ending for, for sure. once, you know, and therapy is a great place to do that. A nice, clean, good closure, you know, say everything we need to say, um, wrap everything up and say goodbye. And uh, un- unfortunately, people don't utilize that enough. And I think I think the the clients are the ones who, who miss out on that experience mm-hmm. because, again, then they, they're not um, they don't have that tool in their toolbox now. No, they don't have that that. Uh, to pull back on and say okay here's how i did an ending before and it worked out this well. was a positive experience yeah. of being intentional and open and direct with feelings that were perhaps very strong or very uh personal very special mm-hmm. with someone that i've shared a lot of very deep and personal things with and uh right if if this is a very special relationship we yeah. want to handle that appropriately yeah um but that's hard for some people that can be really hard for yeah people. Yeah. And uh, and then on top of that, there's – well, let, let me read this this feedback, and we can run off of that too. Here's someone who said, why should I care if Ryan Howes approves of me leaving a therapist or not? <laughs> 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 I recently fired a therapist after two sessions, and I never bothered to consider what Ryan would have thought of it. Maybe Ryan had a graduate degree and a license, but that alone does not mean someone is a decent therapist or teacher. He, he sounds like a pretty self-serving individual to me. In any case, what can Ryan do? Give me detention or some dumb lecture? LOL, whatever. <laughs> Woo. And you're named Jeez. personally there. Okay. I got to say, Martin, I, this, I, I have some, some mixed feelings here, man. I mean, <laughs> you're... These are not my words. You're, I mean, you're, we got to do something with this, though, right? You're giving me a lot of love here today, <laughs> which I, I, I really appreciate. Uh, you know, kind of a this is your life sort of, a, of an experience, but also... Man, we're we're dredging up the. Uh, the hey, you read these too. before. I'm just keeping us on our toes here. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I guess, yes. So this, right? This person is is reacting to that, saying, well, I, I shouldn't have to uh, to have a, a a termination session." And you know what? You don't. Yeah, he's right. You don't. Mm. You. It's. I say many times, it's your time. It's your dime. <laughs> you can. Do, you can Indeed. leave whenever you want. Sure. Uh, but what I want people to know is that with every choice, you know, there are, there are consequences. And one consequence, might, you might be missing out on something sure. that, that could actually be really beneficial for you in your life. Sure. If you uh, if you ghost or, or just kind of disappear. Right. I mean, think of people in movies or in real life who, right, leave a relationship or mm-hmm. and and yes, maybe a lot of feelings came out in the in the process of a breakup, but it didn't feel resolved. It didn't feel clean. Uh, not everything was able to be owned and, and expressed. People leave jobs, you know, oh, yeah. th- throw the papers on the desk and <laughs> storm out. And yeah. while maybe at some level that's empowering, it, it, it can leave some residue that, that doesn't feel great without realizing it. People leave churches, family, sure. whatever it is, you know. And, and I, this person is saying, look, uh, you know, I shouldn't have to do this for for Ryan's sake or sure. for the therapist's sake, right? And and you're right. You're not you're not That's here. To, yeah. You don't have to take care of the therapist. To be honest, though, I have to admit, 
as a therapist, it's more, it is more uh, satisfying for me if we have a closure session. Sure. Because I get that sense of closure as well. Um, but that's not a requirement. You no. don't have to do that. Yeah. So it's a recommendation. It's Ultimately, a recommendation. it's more for, of course, the client's benefit. Right. Um, but there's there's the other side to that. and uh, But at the same time, uh, not not a prerequisite. I've had some Post great, requisite. great terminations, you know? Yeah. Great stuff. And and Indeed. oftentimes when people realize, okay, I'm going to be leaving. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end therapy. I think I'll end in about two months, you know? Great. So we have a few a few sessions left to talk through stuff. And oftentimes new material comes up, you know, mm-hmm. new interesting things. People um, will, will will deal with things differently when they know there's kind of a deadline. Yeah. You know? hmm. It's like, oh, yeah, gosh, I, I'm going to end in two months. And, and I forgot I wanted to deal with this thing, too. Or now this gives me time to, to focus on this one area. A sense of urgency. Yeah. Oh, science project's due tomorrow. I better start researching. Yeah. Yikes. Right. <laughs> right. Here's another uh, audience feedback. Um, when you wrote about ghosting. Ghosting may be a bad ending for the therapist, but for certain clients, it can be the most empowering feeling there is. Imagine it. You finally gather the courage to end therapy because it's just not working. You don't really get along with your therapist and you feel like he leads you in the wrong direction and constantly waste your time and money. You get ready for that final session to spill your guts out about why this will be your last session and you get guilt tripped into continuing to quote work on your feelings. Or maybe your therapist tricks you into scheduling one or two more goodbye sessions. We pay you. I don't owe a grocery store clerk an explanation for not shopping that, uh, at her store anymore. So what makes you think I owe you anything? Wow. Yeah. Woo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there it is again. There it is again. Okay. Yes. You, you're, that's, they're right. That's again. fair criticism, I think. Yeah. Once again, mm-hmm. you're right. Um, and, and I think it's also fair to say that there, I'm sure there are some therapists who, when... You know, if a client brings up, uh, it's uh, I think I'm done with therapy. I'm ready to go. I think some therapists will get scared and, and think of their own or pocketbook take or whatever it personally or take something. A, yeah, and yeah. say, oh no, 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 we need to, to keep going. Um, so we need to work on that area. Mm-hmm. But but there's a difference between therapy and the grocery store or you know any other sort of service that's provided, and that is that therapy is. I believe therapy is a relationship. The relationship itself is the, the reason you come. You know, yeah. I mean, we use words and we relate to one another, and and by having that sense of closure, that that is kind of the the, the last chapter of what relationships are about, right? Sure. Relationships start, they go for a while, and they end. And if you're going to leave before the ending, if you're going to you know um, sidestep that whole process, then you're not learning how to do endings, right? And and that's that's why I say I think it's it's an option that uh, that I wish more people would take us up on. Yeah, but I think maybe this person is again right in that. No, you don't owe it to the therapist. Right. That's not that's not that's not the point. Mm-hmm. Uh, but in some ways, it's this is a way to maximize the therapy experience from beginning to end. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I think another point you made in there is sure you don't owe it to me personally. Um, but hey, if I did something or said something that wasn't so great or wasn't so positive, again, you don't owe that to me, but you know, just, you can think about the other people that this therapist might be seeing that maybe you want to give them that feedback so that they're not doing harm or, you know, uh, handling something else inappropriately with other clients. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's, um, customer satisfaction and quality assurance. Yeah. That's it. Now it's not to say probably for some people. Perhaps ghosting might actually be what they need to do if they're really in a harmful situation, unfortunately, yeah. at least in the interim. Yeah. Um, and so I get that it can be empowering, um, but you're providing uh, some other things to think about, too. Yeah, yeah, sure. And I guess maybe that would be a whole other topic is what when do you know that, it, that therapy is bad enough that you should just get out? Yeah. Um, and the pot's too hot. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Uh, we're going to get more into the personal details of Ryan here a little bit, but um, any other quick take on some of this audience feedback or messages about therapy's image problem, what we got to do to fight against that or correct that? Well, it's <laughs> a mean, lot you, of work. We, we, yeah. we, you did kind of pick some of the more uh, salty comments mm-hmm. there. Um, I mean, <laughs> not everyone has, I think, that negative a, a view of, uh, no, of therapy. I hope not. I would hope not, too. I mean, no. it's, a, it's a select group of people who, who want to read psychology blogs, psychology today blogs on therapy and then, you know, kind of share their negative experience. I don't, don't deny that they're out there. Those negative experiences happen. 
Um, but I do think it's up to us to to do what we can to show people what is actual therapy, what what is helpful therapy, what's what's uh, what, what does good therapy look like, sure. and uh, and help hope that people will start having more conversations about it. Be the change we want to see. Right? Exactly. Start at the grassroots level. That's it. <laughs> That's it. Ryan, is there a book that you recommend most frequently in your practice that you want to highlight here? Yes, sure. Two. I have to say well, that's two. Fine. There's two. That's all right. Uh, I mentioned that I'm not uh, not all that uh, CBT. <laughs> <laughs> you alluded to it, and I think you've warmed over time a little bit without realizing. So when I, when I do uh, have some of those issues come up, especially regarding, like, anxiety. So the Anxiety and Phobia Workbook is probably one that I, I recommend. Oh, um, workbook. Look at you. Anxiety Jeez. and phobia workbook. It's great, great stuff. People <laughs> go through that. They, uh, you know, learn learn the helpful tools. It's all it's all very straightforward. Who's that by, by the way? You want to highlight that one? Oh, I don't remember who that's okay. by. Okay, well, we'll look it up later. <laughs> <laughs> but a book that that is work on the salesman pitch here. There. Yeah. Sorry yeah, about that's that. All right. Okay. I didn't. I didn't. Uh, I don't remember. Okay, we'll look it up. We'll look it up. Um. But a book that I think is, is actually more aligned with uh, with the kind of work that I do is is a book by a woman by the name of Althea Horner. Ah, yeah, local. Althea no, Horner, yes. Local, yeah? She was uh, she was a local woman, Southern California woman, who passed away a couple years ago. Right. Um, she wrote a book called Being and Loving. Uh, Being and Loving: How How to Achieve Intimacy with Another Person and Retain One's Own Identity. Hmm. Being and loving, it is. Um, it wasn't, you know, wildly popular off the bookshelves uh, self help book, but man, it's got everything in there. Hmm. It's just just as far as kind of knowing yourself, you know, having having the sense of identity, and allowing that to uh, to, to transmit into healthy relationships with other people. That's really, it's, it's got That's it all. what it's about. Yeah, sounds like good stuff. So, being and loving, being and loving, Althea Horner. A work of art, music, film, sculpture, architecture that uh, really inspired you. <laughs> I don't think sculpture was really my thing, but uh, <laughs> man, I'm I'm a I'm a product of the '80s, right? Yeah, I've so heard of them. You've heard of the '80s yes. before. Mm-hmm. I was trying to think of like what what actually was the like a formational movie for me. <laughs> <laughs> Believe it or not, a Breakfast Breakfast Club was uh, <laughs> That's nice. Was probably my movie. Okay, because. Um, what because, spoke to you about Breakfast Club? Well, I mean, it's dated now a bit, but but not not so much. I mean, the themes are still there. It was it was just these strangers kind of coming together and being real with one another, right? Yeah. On a Saturday, talking about what was really happening. You know, there's a, there's a scene where we're all just kind of sitting around well, in and the talking library. about in the library. Yeah. They're talking about their parents and they're talking about their, you know, the pressures that they have and the stress that they have. And I mean, that kind of came out for me just a little bit before I got into high school and uh, it was like, oh, okay, it's okay to talk about these things. That's right. Know? John Hughes is at his best, huh? John Hughes at his best. Yeah. I would I would agree. Nice. Cool. I prefer, of course, among the Emilio Estevez uh, repertoire, Men at Work is a real classic. For, me, but, uh, <laughs> Seriously? for no significant reason other than it was really horrible, but Really horrible. Isn't Painfully that the one where he's with his brother? Oh, yeah. Charles yeah, they're Hughes? garbage men. Oh, yeah. my gosh. It's, it's, it's horrible, late 80s. Wow. It's actually pretty darn funny, though, if you watch it and no one remembers that movie. Um, any personal experience, Ryan, that you could share? Uh, I think of this podcast, again, as, yes, a lot of times I'm talking with a fellow professional, but uh, we're yeah. real, real people, too. And yeah. Any experience that taught you a valuable life lesson that uh, we can glean from, from you outside of the therapy context? Well, uh, actually, it would be inside the therapy context okay. for me. I just can't get away from it. Well, uh, <laughs> to, in the... In the uh, in the spirit of being vulnerable and sharing, sharing about therapy experiences, yeah. um, I'm, I lost a parent. My mother passed away when I was a kid. Right. I was ten years old, and um, one of the, one of the wisest moves uh, from my, my remaining parent, my dad, was uh, to put me in therapy. Yeah. Um, and so I spent I think, six months to a year, or something like that, in, in therapy with this therapist, and and as I was kind of reflecting on that. I mean, it was it was a great time for me to have like, okay, this is one place where I can talk to this person 
Um, you know, she's not a member of my family, so I don't have to like worry about her feelings. She's not grieving. You know, everyone else around me was grieving. This is one person who wasn't grieving with me. Mm-hmm. Um, so I felt like I could be, I could be okay. I wouldn't have to protect her feelings at all. Your emotion could be front and center. My emotion could be front and center. Yeah. It could be okay for me to just have this, this time and this space that was just for me. Mm-hmm. I also remember thinking, man, this, this is a person's job. Like she just sits there in this chair and talks to people. That's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I remember thinking yeah. that's that sounds pretty like a like a, a good profession to be in, right? Um, but I also, as I think back on that time, I also think you know I I don't come away from that time with any sort of um, you know I didn't learn techniques or tools. Uh, there was no I don't think there are any really meaningful moments. You know, speaking of moments of meaning, there's one, not no one particular. Well, no, there wasn't anything that kind of jumps out like wow, that was really fantastic. Sure. There were no aha moments there. It was just this space, yeah. just this this place for me to go, and uh, and talk, and uh, and that was all I that was all I needed at the time. Sure, sort of like it wasn't one brush stroke on the canvas. It's the whole picture. Right, uh, right. Yeah. It, you know, we didn't have a, a goodwill hunting moment where she like you know <laughs> threatened to fight me or. You know, <laughs> we didn't have the any hug that got you to release the trauma. Yes, the, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's not your fault. That's it's right. not your fault. No, no sitting down by the river and just. <laughs> no, we didn't Can't have any of that ego. Stuff. It yeah. was it was very very you know subdued in that way, but yeah. but it was also one of the most you know meaningful transformative times of my life. I'm glad, and yeah. uh, and the rest is history. The rest is history. History in the making. Let's say that's it. Any final words, take homes for uh, uh, the audience for of Psych Rally? Uh, yeah, <clears throat> you know, I just want to thank you and all that you do. You know, I mean, it's kind of in the You've been focusing the spotlight on me here, but man, you know, moments of meaning has has been around because, uh, in a large part, because of you, wow. and you being the only person who's spoken at both of the events. Well, there's another story there, but <laughs> and you also, you know, doing this podcast, you know, uh, doing what you can to disseminate the, uh, the 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 wisdom of psychology for the masses. I mean, you're part of the solution. Well, Good on be. you. Trying to. Trying to. I, I learned from the best. Nah. So I appreciate it. Well, keep up the good work. Thank you. Likewise. Thanks. All right. That's Dr. Ryan House. Pleasure. Always good to talk with you. Thank you. Okay. Well, I hope you enjoyed my conversation with uh, a very thoughtful therapist and clinical psychologist, Ryan House. There. Always fun to talk with him. Oh, and you know, and I realized afterwards we didn't even mention what day of the year is National Psychotherapy Day. So, for the record, it's September twenty fifth. Uh, I know we're a ways off from National Psychotherapy 2017, but uh, you know maybe with some of the Christmas or after Christmas sales, you can pick up some turquoise attire to stash for about nine months, or you know even wear frequently between now and then to represent if you feel so inclined. Even better, uh, you know this this profession of therapy that some of us do. It's a funny thing. Uh, we're you know we're trained and licensed professionals, just like so many other lines of work. And the relationships we have with our clients is, of course, a professional one. And yet the nature of that professional relationship is as personal as any, right? And Ryan said we are professional secret keepers. You know, people entrust us with their most personal thoughts, struggles, urges. You know, we may be alongside people when they have their most important discoveries of their life. And that's an extremely special and delicate thing and certainly a privilege and not something to be taken lightly. Uh, you know, we also joked about the the differences between psychoanalysis and cognitive behavior therapy. Um, and if I'll refer you back to episode five if you want to hear some more of my own criticisms of of each respective orientation to psychotherapy. Um, but broadly speaking, I fully believe that both um, general schools have a lot of value, and and that grounding in theory is important for us therapists. And yet. Uh, as we said, you know, good therapy is therapy that helps the person or persons in front of me, regardless of, of whatever whatever you want to call it. So, um, you know, we've been running also on a theme uh, for a few episodes of, of bad therapy or negative experiences of mental health care out there, um, harmful treatment experiences. And, uh, you know, hey, we've got to, got to be honest uh, with people's real experiences, but I also certainly don't want to ignore what I hope are more common, which are positive ones. So um, in light of that, here's another piece of, it, of feedback that someone left on uh, Ryan's blog uh, that's coming from a, uh, that's in a slightly different key. Uh, quote, 
I find that being genuinely understood by a therapist is so highly underrated. I didn't realize how important it was to healing until I experienced it myself. Being understood on a deeper level than uh uh-huh facilitates trust and deep healing. Having someone else explain to you how you're feeling and to be right on the money, that is some serious understanding. Having someone understand you just as well or better than yourself, phew, powerful, end quote. So just another uh, person's take there, which uh, has a more, much more positive take on their experience in therapy. So thank you for that. Um, and uh, thank you uh, th- so much. If you've been following along with me on this psych rally journey, you know, as we wrap up 2016, we are just 20 episodes in, and I'm looking forward to lot, lots more interesting conversations and guests coming up in the new year, um, connecting with uh, more people and hearing your feedback as listeners. So, uh, and please, if you're so inclined, please share any comments or reactions to what you heard on the show notes for this episode at psychrallypodcast.com. Certainly, if you've had uh, also an unpleasant experience in therapy or have other questions, things that you'd like to hear addressed, or even by the same token, if you have a positive experience, I'd love to hear about that as well. Uh, lastly, folks, uh, look out for the videos of Moments of Meaning, Part 2, coming out soon. And uh, love your, your feedback on that and help spreading the word about uh, what we're doing in therapy. Wishing all listeners in the meantime a happy holiday, Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, and New Year. Hmm, I wonder where I can get myself a turquoise shirt. Or pants. I'm not sure I can pull that off. Well, I'll have to keep looking. 